Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this morning's conversation discussing infrastructure's vital role in Ontario's economic recovery. I am your host and moderator for today's conversation, Andrew Macklin, Managing Editor of Renew Canada. As you can see, one of my favorite covers behind me in my backdrop here in my condo. I'm coming to you live from Burlington, but we're excited to see people joining us this morning from across Canada and even some people uh, in other countries around the world. So very excited to have you all this morning. As you might notice, we're using a platform that I'm sure a lot of you aren't necessarily familiar with. So I just wanna give you a breakdown of what the platform does and why we're using this. And, and really it's because there's a lot of interactivity opportunity using the Crowdcast platform. And as you can tell, you also didn't have to download any software or an app or anything to your computer. So one of the things that we love about Crowdcast. So let me just walk you through some of the functionality of this program so you can understand how we're gonna utilize the conversation throughout the day. So I can already see many of you are participating in the chat. Thank you so much. Please say good morning to everyone. Uh, make sure you're interacting, make sure you're discussing with people, uh, have, a, have a great conversation with people throughout the chat window. So that's great. Uh, I'm glad to see you all networking already this morning. If you look along the bottom bar, along the bottom of your screen, you can see a lot of different tabs and we're gonna utilize several of these throughout the conversation. So you will see, for example, there is a poll section and throughout the day, we're going to be posting some polls that will complement some of the information that we're presenting as part of our conversation. And you'll see that there are even a couple up there right now. Uh, I would invite all of you to please take part in the polls, make sure you get your votes in. Uh, hopefully this is going to be some data that we can use as we look at some of the deliverables that we're offering as part of the conversation today. So that's the polling function. I think we're going to post probably about six or eight throughout today's conversation. So please do keep an eye on the poll section. And when we do post something new, please uh, appreciate if you go in and, and vote and we'd love to have your feedback as part of this. Second of all, you'll see the ask a question function. And I know for most people, when you're asking a question in a traditional webinar, you're usually doing it as part of that chat window. And you're usually typing in something and typing in your question and hoping the people that are moderating the conversation are, are catching your question as we go through. Different with Crowdcast. If you have a question that you would like to ask at any time, I invite you to go click on ask a question along the bottom of your screen there and then type in what your question is. You'll also see on the very left-hand side of where the questions are, you'll see a thing that says votes. And in most cases, or at least in the question here, probably has zero or one. If there's a question that has already been asked, that is something that you yourself would like an answer to as well, click on the vote part of ask a question, and that will allow it to be voted on to say, hey, there's more than one person that would actually like an answer to this question as part of this conversation. So invite you to please feel free, ask any questions throughout the conversation. This will be a fully interactive conversation throughout the morning and we invite your questions throughout. I also just wanna remind people that at, at, no matter how long you stay as part of our conversation today, or if you have colleagues that would really like to see this conversation, but were unable to participate this morning, I would let you know that you will receive a free video link to this conversation. I believe it takes something about 48 hours or so for you to receive that link, but you will receive a link to the full conversation uh, within the next couple of days. So, We'll be able to uh, give you that presentation. You'll be able to see all the questions that were asked. Uh, you know, you don't have to furiously take notes throughout the conversation. You'll be able to reference this video along the way. Also, I do want to let you know, um, you know, with the amount of people that are online right now, there are bound to be a few people that may have some audio or, or video issues throughout. Um, if, if you do need to, there is a section up at the very top. Uh, in the top right, if you click on the tab, uh, there is something that allows you to check your audio and video, and that will check the audio and video levels that you have for the conversation and hopefully fix any issues that you may have if your audio and video is not cooperating uh, today because, you know, the bandwidth is being throttled in your area because, you know, every every uh, man, woman and child is is using it to be able to provide one function or another. Please remember that, yes, you will get a live uh, video link to this live conversation after the fact. 
So before I introduce our first speaker, I just want to take a moment to let everyone know kind of how this conversation is going to work this morning. And I apologize, I'm probably going to need some water throughout the day as I hopefully will not be talking as much right in the rest of this conversation as I am right now. However, I just want to give you a layout of how our conversation will work. So once I'm done this introductory bit, we'll welcome John O'Grady, who's the founding partner from Prism, Prism Economics and Analysis. And he will give us a bit of an overview on what exactly the state of the economy is right now and, and how that impacts the infrastructure in, industry. From there, we'll welcome Sandro Peruzza into the conversation. For those of you who don't know Sandro, Sandro is the Chief Executive Officer of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers and the Chair of the Construction Design Alliance of Ontario, who have generously partnered with us for today's conversation. Sandro will build on the remarks that John gives, and then following Sandro's remarks, we'll welcome Andy Manahan. Andy, for those of you who don't know Andy, is the Executive Director of the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario, and he is the Vice Chair of CDAO. Once the three of them have given their introductory remarks, we will have an open conversation where we will address any of your questions about the economics of infrastructure and infrastructure investment in Ontario and otherwise. And, and you'll see just below my face, you'll see a little tab that's just opened up and that will give you live link to the CDAO website in case during this conversation you say, well, geez, I'm not really familiar with CDAO or some of these other organizations and companies that I mentioned, you'll see that live link appear and that will allow you to direct yourself to click on it and go and look at the website and be able to learn a little bit more about that organization. So those will appear throughout today's conversation. And then uh, you know, you'll see them kind of in and out because we want to make sure that you know you learn about all of the different representatives and what organizations and companies they represent. So following our economics conversation, we're going to switch gears. We'll say thank you very much to John O'Grady and Sandro and Andy will continue to join us, but then we'll welcome our fourth speaker into the conversation and that's Claire Hicks. Claire is the program manager for Future Ready at WSP, and she's gonna kick off our innovation conversation because we recognize that while it is important to invest in infrastructure, we recognize that there are innovation components that need to be considered to ensure that the infrastructure we build continues to have relevance in the decades to follow. So we'll welcome Claire into the conversation. She'll give some opening remarks. Sandro and Andy will then build on what she has had to say, and then the four of us will conduct a conversation on the innovation question and where those opportunities are for infrastructure investment as we look at Ontario's economic recovery. And then once that is complete, we'll say thank you very much to all of our speakers. I'll provide a couple of closing remarks, and that will get us right to 11 o'clock, where we will say thank you to all of you for joining us for the conversation. So that allows you to know what's going to happen over the next I see hour and 21 minutes. So why don't we get on with the conversation? And at this time, it is my pleasure to welcome John O'Grady, co-founder of Prism Economics and Analysis, who will join us via video momentarily to have a conversation about the economic situation here in Ontario. There's John. John, welcome to the conversation. Thank you so much for joining Great. us this morning. I think these days, uh, uh, inviting an economist to be the uh, kickoff speaker. It's a little like asking a, an undertaker to welcome folks to the party. Um, let me start with uh, just uh, a review of some of the, the key facts that I think uh, uh, describe our economic situation. Um, first of all, if we simply look at the data from March, and in March we were just transitioning uh, into our present circumstances, uh, comparing March to February, there was a 15% drop uh, in hours worked. Uh, that, I think, quite seriously underestimates the situation that we are currently in. Uh, I looked yesterday at the administrative data from the Canada Emergency uh, Relief Benefit uh, that goes to workers who have uh, lost their job. Uh, and as of yesterday, there were more than 6.8 million persons uh, who had applied for benefits. That's just slightly more than one third of the labor force. So I think we are likely looking uh, at unemployment as we come out of the month of April at somewhere around one third or more uh, of the labor force. 
So how are things likely to unfold as we proceed uh, and as uh, the restrictions and the social distancing uh, requirements are, uh, uh, are somewhat eased at some point uh, later in the spring uh, or in the summer? There are some economists, uh, certainly, who expect a rapid uh, and near full uh, recovery. Uh, and I would very much like to agree with them, uh, although unfortunately uh, I cannot. Um, what they anticipate is that as the uh, social distancing restrictions are lifted, uh, as businesses are given permission to resume their operations, there will be a rapid recovery uh, and that we will see a veritable uh, explosion uh, of pent up consumer demand. Uh, and that's what they call the V-shaped recovery. The policy implication uh, of that view of the world is that what the economy reads, needs right now uh, are simply lifelines uh, to support people during this uh, transition period. And I use the term lifelines to distinguish between support that is um, uh, keeping you going uh, and a stimulus. Uh, a lifeline supports you while you're in the ditch. Uh, it does not get you out of the ditch. Uh, I believe that the, out, the outlook for uh, the next year or two is actually uh, going to be much more challenging uh, than what is suggested by uh, those who, who anticipate a, a V-shaped recovery. This has been a downturn that is unlike any other uh, that we have ever experienced. It did not originate in the financial markets. It did not originate with the bursting of, a, of an asset bubble. Uh, it did not originate because the central banks raised interest rates uh, in order to curtail inflation. This is first and foremost uh, a public health crisis uh, and its principal economic effects uh, are on the supply side. The question therefore is how long those supply side effects will continue and what are their second order effects on the demand side uh, of the economy. I think there's very good reason to believe that <clears throat> the situation we're in uh, will be characterized by a comparatively slow recovery uh, and a chronic deficiency of demand. Uh, until there is a widespread natural immunity or a vaccine, which is I think the only true exit strategy, social distancing will continue to operate. That is going to have serious long-term effects on certain industries, in particular the travel industry, uh, hotels, uh, restaurants, uh, and the retail sector, all of which are very large employers in the economy. Many companies in those industries were not particularly financially strong before COVID-19, they will not survive a protracted period of social distancing and constrained operations. Uh, the unemployment in those industries is anywhere between 40% and 80%, in some cases higher. I think it's unrealistic to expect more than half of those jobs to survive in a protracted transition period. Social distancing, is also going to limit how ordinary businesses manage their workplaces and manage their operations. Consider workers in an office environment. Uh, how, how do workers get to work uh, uh, when the transit systems operation is constrained in order to accommodate social distancing? How do workers in urban centers uh, with high-rise office buildings, how do they actually get to their workplace uh, when the elevator has to be operated in order to allow for social distancing and can only take two, maybe three people uh, at a time? How are offices going to be laid out physically in order to accommodate uh, social distancing? And what are the implications of that for how many people, how many staff you can have operating uh, at any time? How will retail stores operate uh, if they have to limit the number of customers who come in the door? 
How will construction sites uh, change their, their, their operational procedures in order to accommodate the requirements uh, of social distancing and keep workers safe? I think we also need to consider that even setting aside all of some of those issues, there will be significant fragility uh, in supply chains. There will be widespread operational risk to companies simply because their suppliers uh, will be at risk. That has knock on effects in downstream industries. Think of the impact on the construction industry. If there were shortages because of, a, of an outbreak of COVID-19 uh, in the uh, supply chain for aggregates, uh, for rebar, for structural steel, for drywall, uh, just to name only a few of the materials that the construction industry depends on. And bear in mind that most reputable epidemiologists uh, anticipate uh, a second wave of COVID-19 and a need to revert to some, perhaps all, of the restrictions that we have already seen. While there will certainly be a resumption of business operations in many sectors, indeed in most sectors, in my opinion, it is naive to expect that resumption to be anywhere close to pre-COVID-19 levels. The, the recovery, in my view, and perhaps recovery is a misnomer, the recovery will not be V-shaped. What that means is that we're going to see persistently high unemployment and a chronic deficiency of demand. Households that come through COVID-19 with increased debts, with job losses, with fear of job losses, with heightened uncertainty, are not the types of households that drive a consumer-led recovery. Nor in that kind of an economic environment are we going to see a surge in private sector investment to drive a recovery. The shift to protectionism that we are seeing across the globe, I think rules out any likelihood of, a, of an export-led recovery. And surely no one believes that Alberta's oil and gas industry is going to drive an economic recovery in this country in any near, near time period. The risk, and I think it is so real that we should consider it a probability, is that the economy will be stuck in a high unemployment, low investment, demand deficient ditch. Lifelines in those circumstances will not be sufficient. What the economy will need is a true stimulus program, one that is focused on infrastructure, calibrated to absorb excess supply without triggering bottlenecks, and one that prioritizes projects that are ready to be commenced, and that I think means a particular emphasis on repair and maintenance projects, as well as projects whose design uh, uh, process is, uh, is well advanced, that are near shovel ready, to use the term. In addition, I think we also will have to get serious about addressing and frankly, this has been a problem for some time. Uh, the inordinate delays that characterize the approval process uh, and the procurement process. Those delays have always imposed a significant cost, but in the environment in which we are moving into, uh, those delays, frankly, are deadly. The cost that they entail is intolerable, uh, and those delays and the bottlenecks associated with them uh, have to be addressed. Rest. So to summarize, uh, we are moving into uh, uncharted waters, uh, but we do know that we have the means, uh, the instruments, the guidance uh, to get through those uncharted waters. And a key instrument for getting through the situation that we are entering, for achieving a real recovery, uh, uh, is the use of infrastructure. Uh, to get us out of the ditch, 
And I think it is in, 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 incumbent on governments today uh, to be looking at uh, the situation that we're going to be in three months from now, four months from now, uh, and to recognize that this will be an economy that needs a stimulus program, not simply lifelines, and that infrastructure is going to play a key, indeed, probably the key role uh, in that stimulus package. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Appreciate your opening remarks to kick off our conversation this morning. Uh, before I introduce Sandra Peruzza to the conversation. I just want to remind you, of course, along the bottom, in case you just joined us, uh, you will see that there is the opportunity to vote on our polls by clicking on the polls tab along the bottom of the screen. And there's also an opportunity to ask your questions, which we'll have a general conversation on the economics of infrastructure once we welcome our next two speakers into the conversation. And let's get the first one of those in to uh, build on John's remarks. It's my pleasure to now introduce Sandro Peruzza. Sandro is the CEO of the Ontario Society of Professional Engineers, and he's also the chair of the Construction and Design Alliance of Ontario. And we'll be bringing him into this conversation to build on the thoughts from John. Welcome to the conversation, Sandro. Your thoughts on what John had to say setting up our conversation. Well, it was certainly uplifting to hear all that. Um, you know, as a, a father of four children, uh, all uh, three of them are work ready. Uh, the prospects aren't great, and uh, it looks like they're going to be living at home for quite a while. Uh, but yeah, I, I tend to agree with uh, with John's uh, observations and analysis uh, shows. Everything we've talked to, when we talked to our members and we've talked to other industries, have uh, indicated that there's a willingness to get back to work, a willingness to restart. Uh, however, there are a lot of barriers in a way f uh, to prevent that from happening. Uh, I also agree that uh, infrastructure is a, a tremendous way to try to get the economy up and running again. Great stimulus investment. Uh, I'm going to let Andy talk to uh, some of the numbers. I know uh, his group has done a study um, looking at the economic and social benefits of infrastructure. Uh, and uh, But I, I'll, I'll talk at a high level first off around that. I, you know, looking at any infrastructure project, uh, you can just imagine the spin-off economic benefits of that. I look at the, you know, number of engineers, architects, planners, uh, contractors, labor, skilled trades, inspectors, building officials, all involved in these projects. Uh, so it's, you know, a, a, a massive workforce that uh, can get uh, mobilized and, and back to work. Uh, then you take into account the supply chain, mass timber, drywall, concrete, steel, fasteners, tools, the list goes on. So now you have all those involved in a supply chain that it can benefit from the economic stimulus. Uh, then you have the rental equipment suppliers. Uh, you, John talked to the uh, restaurants. Uh, you know, uh, I know I've, I've worked on sites in the past and uh, you have the food truck come on, but also you take advantage of the local restaurants around those sites to, you know, uh, do some takeout either before the shift at during lunch or at the end of the shift. So, you know, local restaurants, food stands that will benefit from it as well. Uh, people in, in in this industry make a decent wage. Uh, you know, it, it's certainly a lucrative uh, career for any young uh, professional to look at. Uh, but they buy tools, they buy trucks and vehicles for both for on the site and off the site for their personal use. Uh, they have their own homes. Uh, you know, they, they have their families they look after. Some of them uh, have dependents, either uh, elderly parents or young children, uh, you know, and they, they invest in that. They buy TVs, go on vacations. Uh, you know, that money goes back into the economy. Uh, but, the, but looking at the social side of it as well, the infrastructure we build serves communities. And you, you know, we're building new homes and condos for young families. Uh, new transportation routes expedite the flow of goods and services across the province and across the country. Uh, new hospitals and healthcare centers are being built, which really look like a great investment now. Uh, schools, universities are training, uh, you know, our youth to, to be ready for the new knowledge economy that's coming. John's right, you know, traditional industries aren't going to survive. So what are the new industries that we can be developing to uh, get the economy up and running? Uh, you know, bridges and roads that connect communities, uh, parks, soccer fields, community gardens, uh, the list goes on. Uh, and what I'm really proud about this group and this industry, uh, specifically around the people around the table at CDO, 
is we really do look at the social benefits of what we design and build. And we do look at the environmental protections to ensure that when we design and build, we do so in a responsible way. Uh, our members are part of the Green Building Alliance. Uh, we're integral in having government establish, you know, the new excess soils regulations. And it goes without saying health and safety, uh, occupational health and safety and wellness is always our first priority. Uh, we all have some different affiliations with the various health and safety associations and with the Prevention Council to make sure that, uh, you know, we're actually leading the development of the new health and safety protocols. So, uh, you know, I think there are a lot of benefits, uh, but, uh, and further on in conversation, we'll probably talk about some of the obstacles that we need to remove in order to get uh, the economy up and running and get these projects running. And uh, I'll pass it on to Andy now. Thank you very much, Sandro. And, uh, you know, as, as Sandro just alluded to, we're going to add the fourth member of our conversation. And it is my pleasure at this time to welcome the Executive Director of the Residential and Civil Construction Alliance of Ontario and Vice Chair of the CDAO, Mr. Andy Manahan, who will be joining our conversation to provide his thoughts and build on the remarks from, from John. Oh, John. Rowan. Rowan. There, there is, is Andy, 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 Okay, um, I'd just like to thank everyone, first of all, for uh, welcoming us um, uh, today. And I guess, the, you know, the one advantage of these virtual meetings is in a lot of cases, we're seeing uh, people's personal living spaces. So uh, thank you for allowing us to do that. <laughs> Um, I certainly um, uh, don't want to replicate uh, some of the very thoughtful comments from John about the uh, depressing um, prospects ahead. Uh, I'd like to think of this uh, perhaps a little bit more optimistically, although I recognize it's going to be tough times for a lot of people, but I prefer that if the construction sector were viewed as the opera singers on the balconies or the pot bangers at 7.30 if you're in downtown Toronto and other cities. So if you extend that matter for uh, the construction sector could be like the orchestra. We might be a little bit out of tune at first, but hopefully we'll get back to some uh, better uh, equilibrium state. The usual indicators, and, and, and John is uh, a specialist at this, but you know the GDP numbers are tanking, stock markets are wacky, uh, oil prices are kind of in negative territory. So I think everyone knows this. Um, you know the, the reports that Sandra mentioned that we've been doing in the past. I think those are probably useful benchmarks to a certain degree, but the utility I think is declined and maybe people like Paul Smetan and if they're on the call can uh, elaborate uh, on that um, sort of a thing. So certainly across the entire economy, uh, many businesses uh, will not survive. We, we will have uh, supply chain disruptions. There's no doubt about that, but I, I, I do agree with the previous speakers that uh, state of good repair projects. Uh, asset management planning kind of things that municipalities and others do uh, will provide for opportunities and growth in a new economy, whatever that might uh, look like, but it will not be business as usual. Um, I was on a Zoom call yesterday with um, uh, an, about 34 people, uh, Thomas Homer Dixon, who's written on climate change uh, very uh, thoughtfully uh, over a few decades. Uh, talked about the cascading changes that are related to the COVID-19 pandemic, but uh, he said we have to focus on um, an economic recovery that will be transformative. So we're going to have to develop new approaches, new economies, uh, and new economic pathways. And um, he cited energy as being one of the areas, and I won't go into any detail on that, but you know things like ultra-deep geothermal, uh, carbon capture and storage. So we definitely will not return to uh, status quo. It will be, and I know Todd Latham will like this word, it'll be a reinvention. Uh, we're going to have to uh, somehow improve our uh, total system uh, resiliency. There's another RE word, uh, Todd. Um, and just before uh, we open it up, I would like to say that um, RCCO released a report yesterday afternoon uh, that looked at how the construction sector can help uh, governments um, build uh, subway and other transit projects more cost effectively. So we recognize that all governments will be revenue constrained, they're printing money like crazy, and uh, anything we can do as an industry, uh, in the broader industry, as Sandra said, engineers all the way down through the line to the trades, uh, we need to look at. And, you know, Richard Lyle, who's a, a great friend and a colleague of mine, um, you know, represents the residential sector. And, 
he's been banging the drum or the pot in this case for many years now on e-permitting and, and doing things a little bit more effectively. So we have to use uh, uh, innovative techniques and new technology to uh, the best possible extent. So I'll wrap it up there, but I really look forward to the conversation in people's personal living rooms. Thank you very much, Thank Ann. Thank you very much, Ann. Um, I, think um, I think the first question, first I'd, like question I'd like to ask is to talk, is to about, talk about the issue of health. Issue of health. What's the new, What's the new going, going to look like? like? What is the, what is the uh, dollars, uh, and, dollars and, and going to have to do? Have to do? Sandra, I know, Sandra you I know you and I have a conversation about this, this the other day. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Was getting getting an echo. Um, we lost your audio. We lost your audio. So, Andy, do you want to? I actually couldn't hear your question as well. It was all uh, jarbled, jumbled. <laughs> what I'm asking, what I'm asking is, the health, is the health and safety, health and safety regime. regime. Oh, yes. Okay. Um, I, I can talk a little bit on that, and, and if Sandro gets his audio back, he can certainly jump in. Um, uh, with our staff, uh, we have regular meetings uh, most mornings to talk about uh, uh, the work that Andrew Pariser and other people within the CDO network are doing with respect to enhancing uh, health and safety procedures on site. So I know that John mentioned in an office environment, uh, you know, you may only have one or two uh, people going up uh, in terms of that physical distancing that we're going to require. We already are doing those sorts of things and much, much more on construction sites. If there's a hoist that has to take workers up on a multi-story building, you may only have one at a time. The impacts of, of doing all these things, which are obviously quite necessary, is that uh, overall work will be slowed down. And it's not just supply chains, it's work on the site. Um, the government has recognized this, obviously, uh, considering that um, we're now an essential service for very many aspects of construction and have allowed us to extend work hours for important projects uh, related to health and other activities. Um, so. The overall uh, milieu on the sites is much different right now. The protocols in place are, from what I've heard, are very good, but it does take longer to do uh, the work that is typically done on a, on a project. Sandra? Sandra? Yep. Uh, yeah. uh, sorry, there's a bit of an sorry, echo. There's a bit of an echo. I'll, 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 I'll work through it. If you sorry, if you, you, sorry, you, sorry you, just if my just if, if my, 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 if my level, level, level speaker down, that would speaker be down, that would be helpful. Be helpful. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll try I'll putting try that. Putting that. Uh, uh, first off, first off, uh, uh, build on build what Andy, on what was, Andy saying. was saying. The, the, uh, we've uh, we've uh, worked hard, hard to identify, identify what some of the hazards, hazards are and, and ensure that ensure infection, that infection more going to spread on our sites. Uh, you know, we're looking at new PPE that we're putting in place. We're looking at um, you know new uh, procedures and protocols, uh, things like starting uh, our sites uh, at different times, staggering. Uh, when people get back to work or when people uh, enter the sites, when they leave, extending the hours. Uh, so we are doing our part to ensure that, uh, again, occupational health and safety is, is first and foremost in our minds. Uh, however, there's going to be, um, people need to work together. I mean, it's not perfect. Uh, there are going to be delays. Uh, you know, we have to work through these challenges. It's a new experience for all of us at CDO, the owners in labor and government. Uh, and there's been disputes and there's been a lot of confusion. Uh, first off, as governments decided what projects went forward and then they adjusted the list and then that caused more confusion because, you know, do we continue, do we not, uh, so forth and so on. Uh, we Again, we developed a lot of recommendations for government. To John's point, when these lists, when these projects get back online, uh, it's not going to be like you flip a switch and we get back to 100%. There's going to be a gradual uh, restarting of the projects, uh, but there's going to be a hesitancy uh, to go back to work as well. 
Uh, you'll have people who've been off. They're going to ask whether it's safe. Uh, you'll have investors who are not going to be uh, fully confident in investing in new projects as well. Uh, you know, um, the contracts have to be restructured to take into consideration that, that there's going to be disruptions. They also need to be taken into consideration that there may be a second or even a third wave. So uh, the contracts have to take into consideration, uh, you know, that things aren't going to be back uh, as normal. Uh, so we have to accept disruption. We have to accept delays. And uh, that's going to be the new normal. And it's, we'll work through it all. Uh, we need to trust each other. And we need to trust the process. And there's going to be new processes, but I think we all learn through it together. And that's, I think, the value of uh, CDAO is, you know, we represent different parts of the design. Uh, you know, everything from planning to designing, the pre-work that goes into the environmental side before, uh, then you, you build, and then there's the operate and uh, the touch-up and the maintenance that goes on after. So we're all coming together and trying to work this out. And I think it's a really strong voice and a lot of experience that is going uh, and making these recommendations to government and to the industry. Great. Thank you very much, Sandro. Uh, John, I would be curious to hear your thoughts on this, just to provide some feedback on what exactly you think of the new health and safety regime that will be necessary. Um, well, the, the um, uh, central feature of, of, of a new health and safety regime will be one that accommodates uh, social distancing. Um, um, I think uh, if we, I think if we, if we go back to um, back uh, to um, uh, March, um, uh, it wasn't uh, just the government that shut down a number of construction sites. Uh, it was the workers. Uh, they were genuinely afraid. Uh, of the work procedures uh, on the site uh, and the risk of infection that uh, uh, that entailed. So, there, so there's going to need to be a very significant uh, redesign of, of uh, uh, construction workspaces and work processes in order to give people the confidence uh, that they can go to work with, uh, uh, with a high degree of likelihood uh, of uh, not being uh, uh, infected by uh, by COVID. Um, I think the, uh, uh, we also will need to look at some of the, the legal aspects uh, of, uh, of construction. I mean, surely in these circumstances, we don't want to wait for the Supreme Court to tell us what the meaning of force majeure is uh, in, uh, in common law uh, and when a contract has been frustrated uh, and cannot be uh, fulfilled as, as, it was, uh, as it was written. Uh, surely these are not the circumstances uh, in which uh, any contractor, a general contractor or a trade contractor, uh, should be subjected should be subject to penalties uh, when there is a, uh, a delay uh, in completing the tasks that is a result of, the, of the, the change in these work processes and the fact that people do not know yet uh, how to estimate the amount of time that it's going to take to, uh, to complete particular construction tasks uh, under new under new models of, of work organization, uh, so I think we're going to have it's it's not just the the operational side uh, of construction that we're going to have to look at. We're all going to have to, we're also going to have to look at the legal environment, uh, which assigns responsibilities and risks to, to the different players in construction, uh, because as the world changes, the, the way in which you allocate those risks and liabilities uh, also has to change. Thank you, John. Uh, I think we're going to go to the question forum right now. And there is one question that everyone seems to want to have an answer to. And I think it's a really important one. Uh, the question that we have is the stimulus funds coming from federal and provincial governments will be directed to shovel ready projects. How can we ensure that these projects are also shovel worthy? I know that was a big question in uh, 2008. So, uh, Andy, I'd be curious to get your thoughts on this first. Let's let's hear. Let's hear. Yeah. 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 Sure. Um, yeah, you're right, Andrew. Ten years ago, um, because of the financial collapse, uh, there were issues with um, trying to get the money out. One of the examples that I like to use is that in Ontario, uh, we couldn't take advantage in a timely fashion of uh, federal monies 
because a lot of our municipal projects have to go through the class environmental assessment process and the research uh, and advocacy work we've done in that process indicates that in many cases uh, for a bridge or uh, sewer rehab that could take you two and a half years or longer um, and that was outside of the window that the stimulus was intended for. I think the benefit right now is that um, a lot of municipalities have developed asset management plans so there are projects on the books that have been reviewed, have been debated by local councillors and mayors and so I would view those as ready to go. So as long as we can do things um, that will expedite approvals at the front end and I'll just give you an example. RCCO works very closely with the Municipal Engineers Association. They have a webinar uh, later this afternoon on how to conduct public consultation during COVID. So again, more virtual meetings to get feedback from the public on features or aspects that they might like to see. So let's say that there is a heritage bridge uh, that is not going to withstand uh, severe storms in the future. Rather than take uh, two and a half years uh, to go through the usual process, are there ways that we can streamline those uh, planning approvals to make sure that we build the infrastructure in a, in a faster and more uh, productive way? On this, on this. Sorry, Sandro, go ahead. Okay, uh, I agree with uh, with Andy. Uh, I, OSPE uh, a few years ago was, uh, I guess, contracted by the Canadian Federation of Municipalities to develop an asset management 101 course that and we, that we delivered actually right across the country. And it was uh, they asked us back to develop an asset management 201, and now we're developing an asset management 301 course. So I know municipalities have been doing their asset management planning. I know it was a condition for uh, uh, project funding uh, under the uh, previous uh, plan for infrastructure development. Uh, in our conversations, and we've all been talking to various people in ministries and with ministers around this, around economic stimulus, and uh, I, was, I was told that uh, they already have the list. They have the list because uh, the asset management plan that was done, municipalities have submitted their projects prior to COVID-19. Uh, the government was just waiting for the federal government, to, or provincial government was waiting for the federal government to step up with their share of the stimulus package. Um, again, this was all uh, pre-COVID-19. So my understanding is that once the federal government comes forward and saying, here's what we're going to do to to stimulate the economy with respect to infrastructure, the list is uh, ready to go. Uh, so our request is actually, let's release the list now. Uh, don't wait. Let's say, here are the projects we have. Uh, uh, on schedule. Uh, that way we can actually start doing the work now. Uh, engineers can start doing the pre-design work. Uh, engineers, architects can start doing that. Uh, on the environmental side, you can start doing the site site assessments, uh, again, because it does take a long time to do the environmental assessments. So we can actually start doing a lot of this stuff now because that can be done uh, via social distancing. Uh, engineers and architects and planners have been working on design remotely. Uh, I know uh, the Ford engineers, uh, Ford Motor Company, they're developing the new electric uh, Mustang, which I'm really looking forward to seeing. Uh, but they've been using uh, online collaborative software to actually design that car remotely uh, from their own home offices. So if you can design uh, you know, a sports car with all those moving pieces remotely, then you can certainly design an infrastructure project remotely as well. Thank you, Sandro. Uh, John, there's a the next question that I want to turn to probably is something you will be best to address. I'm just curious if this is something you've done some work on. I know you've done some work with organizations like Infrastructure Ontario. And the question that we have is, is there a study that outlines the positive community impact of infrastructure projects, in particular employment and local business uplift? This data would be very useful in advancing our programs. Uh, well, there's two ways that um, uh, economists uh, uh, look at the at the um, benefits to infrastructure investment. The classical or traditional way is to use what's called uh, an input-output model that uh, uh, 
uh, where the input is the uh, additional expenditure on infrastructure and the output is the is the employment that is generated both in the industries that are producing the infrastructure and then the spin-off effects as the people in those industries spend their money uh, uh, elsewhere throughout the economy. <clears throat> um, and that, uh, that approach tends to underestimate the benefits uh, because it doesn't take account of the um, uh, economic advantages of the infrastructure itself, of the increased efficiency uh, for the economy that is conferred by the infrastructure. Uh, the Canadian Centre for Economic Analysis did a study, I believe uh, uh, this may have been the study that um, uh, Andy, your organization commissioned, uh, which I think broke considerable new ground uh, in, in demonstrating the economic, the broader economic benefits uh, of infrastructure investment in this country. Thank you very much, John. And yeah, we'll we'll follow up with Andy here because Andy, you're right. John's right. I know you. Did I know that. you did that. In See ya. See ya. Uh, curious, uh, curious what one was able to result in their research. Research. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yep. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Good. Just one. I was toggling my mute switch there a second ago. Um, yeah. The uh, research that uh, Canadian Center for uh, Economic Analysis did, I think, uh, was very helpful. We did an update bulletin uh, a little less than a year ago, so the spring of 2019. Uh, that particular research confirmed that overall the federal government uh, has underinvested in infrastructure. I think they're at about the 0.4% of GDP level. Now, using GDP now may be a little bit uh, difficult because of the situation over the last several weeks. However, um, it did show uh, that um, the contributions that the federal government uh, have made, although important and welcome, um, uh, they have been receiving uh, an oversized benefit in terms of taxes and other revenues and that sort of thing. So I know that, uh, you know, as John said, there are various programs the federal government is doing right now, but it is still important for the federal government to uh, loosen up the purse strings, so to speak, to get the infrastructure money flowing. We do know that in the first term of the Trudeau government, their phase one infrastructure program was very slow out of the gate. Um, I think David Morley's um, uh, listening in today. He might be able to comment a bit later, but uh, you know, the Canada Infrastructure Bank, I think has $35 billion um, sitting there, some of it spent, but not all of it, obviously. That could be helped to um, uh, loosen up or, or grease the wheels uh, and get some uh, very important infrastructure projects going. So I think the timing is perfect right now for the federal government to work in collaboration with uh, the other orders of government, province, and local. Thanks, Andy. Thanks, John, Andy. John, we, we shift off of the conversation about the economics of infrastructure. I think it's really important for us all to understand what those hiccups could be, what those headaches could be, what are the roadblocks that are going to get thrown up in front of everyone that could prevent this money flowing in a timely manner and really maximizing the level of the investment. And Sandra, I'm going to look to you first on this one because you know I know in conversation with you in the past, we've talked about what some of these roadblocks are for infrastructure investment. And I'm just curious to hear uh, from you what exactly you think are the real hangups here and uh, you know what we need to be able to do to remove any roadblocks from uh, infrastructure investment. Uh, just yeah. trying to, there we go. Just trying to <laughs> unmute myself. Okay. Uh, yeah, I know. It's, the joys of technology. Uh, Joys of technology. You would think that, you know, being connected to engineering, this would be simple for me, but uh, it's not. <laughs> okay, so some, so I think uh, we've alluded to some of them uh, in the past. Uh, you know, uh, certainly the delays in, in getting approvals, uh, both at municipal level and provincial level, and then get the federal money going is going to be uh, one of the challenges. Uh, the confidence in our market is going to be another challenge. Uh, you know, investors stepping up. Uh, you know, uh, municipalities right now, they're not allowed to run deficits. So uh, I know they've had to reach into the reserves uh, to deal with uh, COVID-19 and public health related costs. So will they be able to borrow to build some of this infrastructure? That's going to be a, a huge question that needs to be answered and whether the, the province will allow that to happen. We hope, we hope so. Uh, but there's two other issues that we haven't talked about. Number one is... Uh, the liability issue. Uh, 
Uh, professional and personal liability costs have gone about 400, 500 times up. Sorry, 400, 500% uh, have increased over last year. So if you're an engineer uh, or a design professional and you wanted to get personal professional liability, you're paying four to five times what you paid last year. This was pre-COVID-19. Uh, Post-COVID-19, I can imagine uh, th they'll continue to go up significantly or you're not going to get liability insurance at all. Uh, uh, Steve Ness can speak much more eloquently from the Sur from Surety Canada around bonding, uh, you know, the the apprehension in the market uh, for these projects because of the potential delays with the second and third wave coming through and, and all the uh, lawsuits that have been happening. Uh, and then the, the other thing, uh, just a recent conversation we've been having with IO and with Metrolinx is the perceived talent gap um, in design world. And specifically, uh, they were talking about engineering. Uh, do we have the right engineers that we need to design the infrastructure we need for the future? Not the infrastructure we need today, but we want infra you know, infrastructure in the last 50, 75 years. So are we gonna be designing the infrastructure we need for our children and our grandchildren um, with that technology embedded in it? Those are some significant concerns that we need to address as well. Uh, before, the, again, these projects are going to take off. Thank you very much, Sandro. And and John, before we uh, say goodbye to you to move into just that very conversation that Sandro just alluded to about innovation, I'm just wondering, uh, from your perspective, you know, the amount of an economic analysis you've been able to do, what are those real roadblocks that we could be faced with as we start to phase in this shovel-ready investment? Uh, and what can we do to make sure we remove those barriers? Uh, well, I think that the, the two barriers that are potentially the most significant are first uh, approval processes. Uh, those are going to have to be expedited for, uh, for projects that are ready to go. Uh, the second is, is funding mechanisms. Uh, and when you're dealing with an economy as we were pre-COVID-19 that was operating fairly close to capacity, uh, you have to be very careful in the way in which you fund major projects. Uh, you have to you have to take account of the taxing capacity of the governments that are that are responsible for those pro for those projects and and their and the borrowing capacity. When you're dealing with an economy that is going to be characterized as I expect it will be by chronic deficient demand, uh, by high levels of unemployment, high levels of uh, uh, unused excess capacity, uh, those constraints are much less important. Uh, historically, the Bank of Canada uh, has really had only one client, uh, the government of Canada. Uh, it is uh, recently um, started uh, purchasing provincial bonds, which was a, um, this is something it has not done uh, historically in the, in the past. It is now doing that now. It could do much more. Uh, the Bank of Canada in these circumstances uh, could also be a source of funding uh, for provincial governments. Uh, and that would enable them to borrow uh, at uh, interest rates that are you know, next to zero uh, with a lender uh, which is going to offer uh, uh, terms, indeed may never ask for repayment of, of the funds in the, in the, in the, in the first place. Uh, so I think we're going to have to be, become much more creative and innovative uh, about how we fund uh, uh, infrastructure uh, and get the money out the door to the projects much more rapidly than we have done in the past. Thank you very much for that, John. And uh, before we move on, I, I, I'm curious, I got to get Andy into this conversation because I know, uh, you know, Andy, you brought it up earlier talking about environmental assessment and some of the issues there. And I'm just curious to hear from you, what are some of the other roadblocks that we might encounter that we need to make sure that we remove uh, before we, you know, really see the, the value of this investment? Uh, well, there are uh, lots of uh, roadblocks, but let me just uh, try to remain uh, optimistic. Uh, John sent me a note uh, last night that he had heard that there had been some meetings with uh, some uh, pension fund, uh, Canadian pension fund, with uh, with the government of Ontario. And so um, I just wanted to emphasize that uh, we shouldn't rely on governments entirely for the funding because I think uh, that uh, basin is a little bit uh, dry, shall we say. Um, but uh, in terms of long-term infrastructure investments, I think there is a good role for the continuing use of public-private partnerships. 
uh, and I think pension funds could play a good role in that. Um, some of the major unions um, uh, do have uh, financial arms, and so I think if we look at this in terms of Canadians reinvesting in themselves, I mean, one of the uh, things that uh, Premier Ford has mentioned is that why aren't we building certain medical supplies here? So if supply chains are going to be a problem in the future, maybe this is the impetus right now to start uh, ensuring that uh, our manufacturing sector is uh, built up again and uh, we keep uh, products and supply chains relatively tight. So, I mean, there's lots of barriers. We can all go through that list. I just, you know, approvals is a big one. Um, we need to talk to um, all governments, uh, but as well for the big projects, Metrolinx and Infrastructure Ontario in terms of their contract terms. So I think uh, I saw on the chat list there that uh, Todd chimed in about force majeure, but I mean, if it does take longer to deliver a project, then P3s are typically, we're looking at a very tight time frame and there are going to be penalties if you don't finish at certain stage dates. I think that kind of stuff, we have to have a lot more flexibility and recognition that we are in, in very uncertain times and we can't do business as usual. And we don't want to have, you know, a second or a third, as Sandra said, uptick again. We want to compress that. So we want to be able to do the right thing for our workforce and all of the other people that are around it and ensure that we do gradually, as I think a lot of people are saying, it's not a switch. We're, 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 we're doing a dimmer switch and gradually getting back up to where we want to be. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this time, I'd like to thank John O'Grady for joining us in today's conversation from Prism Economics and Analysis. And uh, just so everyone knows, if you have any questions for any of our speakers that uh, we have not had a chance to get to, please let me know. Uh, we'll get my email address in the chat box. At some point, I'll, I'll, you'll see me move a little bit and my shoulders will so get going because I'll be typing my email address in. But if you have any questions, or you'd like to get in touch with any of our speakers at any time, please let me know and we'll be able to make sure to connect the two of you. So John, thank you very much for joining us today. As we say goodbye to John, we're gonna prepare for the second half of our conversation because as Sandro alluded to about five minutes ago, you're talking about the need for innovation and, and making sure that whatever we invest in in our post COVID-19 investments, be it at the provincial or the federal scale, it really needs to take into consideration the future of those assets and ensuring that they are viable 50, 60, 80, 100 years down the road. And, and certainly that's something that we want to ensure. We wanna make sure that government officials here as part of this, but what does investing in innovation look like? And, and for that part of our conversation today, it is my pleasure to welcome into our chat from WSP, the program manager for Future Ready, Claire Hicks. Uh, Claire will be joining us shortly. And while we're getting Claire involved in the conversation, just want to remind everybody to participate in the polls at the bottom of our uh, bottom of your bar of the conversation here, and as well your ability to ask a question as well. So please continue to participate. Claire, thank you very much for joining us and uh, bringing in kind of the innovation element of the conversation. Yeah, thank you for having me, and um, it's great to to be able to represent WSP in this conversation. We have uh, a big part to play in a lot of Ontario's infrastructure projects and across Canada too. Um, as you, you mentioned in my introduction that I lead a program called Future Ready at WSP Canada and I want to give a very quick introduction to that because really the way that we structure the program is the way that I want to uh, address the conversation today. So Future Ready as a program is really grounded in, in the knowledge and the understanding that our future will look different from today. Uh, we know that to be true, but we don't know what that future will look like. So what we try to do through Future Ready is see the future more clearly by understanding the key trends that will that will impact our, our decision making, that will impact our projects, um, and most importantly, impact the communities that use the projects and that and that keep our economy alive. Um, and we, we really look to design for that future today by integrating a response, whether it's a technical design response or, or more of a, um, a structure and a theoretical response into the way we deliver our projects. Um, so what, I, what I'm going to do, you gave me the, the opportunity to talk about innovation. I'm going to take a step back from, from looking at the immediate response coming out of, of the current crisis. And I'm really going to take a, take a more holistic and future focused approach to um, how we make infrastructure investments in the future. Um, 
the three speakers have given a really great overview of, of that already. So that's going to be the last thing I talk about, actually, in, in this in this discussion. Um, how and when we invest in infrastructure and, and the procurement structure and um, skills that we need to make that successful. So the first two things I want to talk about kind of go hand in hand, and that is um, why we're investing in infrastructure, um, why there's a need for that and why it's so important, and then what that infrastructure might look like. And I'm going to take the liberty of extending that beyond built infrastructure and really looking at our social and digital infrastructure as well. So the why behind infrastructure investment is really that a strong society and a strong community enables a strong economy. Um, and often that is enabled by and facilitated by infrastructure. Um, and the what behind that is, is what, what social and what uh, digital infrastructure exists to allow that to happen. Uh, something that I've observed as, as one of the, one of the younger, the younger generation um, is that communities already do and will increasingly exist in a digital realm. And this current crisis um, has strengthened and, and really created um, a growth in those digital communities. Uh, we've seen we've seen people coming together on on Zoom calls, as you've all mentioned. Um, we've seen my local cocktail bar is turned into a grocery store, which um, delivers. You can only order and and deliver through digital means. Uh, we saw in the New Zealand earthquake in Christchurch earthquake that Facebook groups are the things that that brought communities together and brought um, strength and brought help to each other. So what I'm interested in, um, in exploring, and I don't necessarily have the answer, but is how we can keep the strength of these digital communities and the trust that people have finally started placing in digital technologies and, and in their data, how can we keep that strength while people get back to work and while we, while we get back to growing um, an economy? And as a second component to that, how do we how do we maintain that digital growth, but also reconnect people with the geographic communities that sit around them, um, with their neighbors, uh, with their local local stores and the local economies that we've that we've already talked about as being so important. Um, and I think there are a few things on those geographic communities I want to touch on first that we, we can start to invest in and, and maybe we already invest in but place a little more focus on. And that is the investment in, um, in the built environment in the way that it brings people together. So the value of green space, the value of access to water, um, the mental health benefits that prov that provides are almost as strong as the physical physical benefits and the, and the physical health benefits. Um, I might be so bold as to say that we don't replace like for like. We we are not putting in high quality green space and high quality public space um, when we when we take away a, a park perhaps and build on top of it. Um, and I think if we're able to bring in those ecosystem services, both to the natural environment and the social environment, um, we will stimulate the local economy through healthy people, through mentally and physically healthy people. And I think that um, is something that um, that will be increasingly important and that people will start to value even more. Um, the next component I'll cover is the, that digital infrastructure. Um, and we've, we've, as I was mentioning, we've seen that people have come together in the digital realm. Um, and I was taking a quick look. I've had issues with most of my calls where the internet connectivity is not good enough. Um, and I was taking a look. Quebec City, Calgary, Edmonton, Winnipeg, Montreal and Halifax all have higher internet speed scores than any city in Ontario, with the exception of London. But um, so as Canada's biggest city with most of like a, a strong part of our economy here, uh, we probably need to be investing in that digital infrastructure to allow people to be connected to each other, to allow the economy to uh, to keep going when people are working from home, um, especially as coming out of this, people might choose to work from home even more. Um, and I really do think that there's We've, we've seen issues around projects like Sidewalk Toronto with, with public concern over data privacy, quite rightly. Um, and I already mentioned that we have we have seen this very rapid emergence of a, of a positive relationship with, with data and with the digital world. Um, and I wonder how we can use that for good in our, in our infrastructure investment. Um, a theme that quite nice, nicely ties us together is the idea of conscious cities. So a conscious city um, extends from the idea of a smart city um, and it looks at how we how we create a city that is aware of its residents and aware of its users and can create a built environment that is um, dynamic and adaptable. 
So um, transit networks, for example, that don't necessarily just run to the same schedule every day, but respond to the needs of the users and anticipate the needs of the users. Um, so perhaps if we're, if we're seeing that there's a, an, an extreme weather or a climate event coming up, we can adapt transit needs, transit, uh, transit use accordingly. Um, and I think too often we, we forget about that human element of our cities. Um, we're responsive to it rather than proactively looking to, to facilitate and grow that. Um, a complementary idea to that is slow data. So slow data differs from big data in that it uses qualitative information about, about the people that are providing that data uh, and the conditions that the data has been captured under to, to learn something about the social context that it was developed in. Um, and it doesn't have the same scale and complexity as big data, but it has depth and insight that allows us to make intelligent decisions about, um, about our cities. And, um, and I think we have the opportunity now to, to pause, uh, to look at what data we have and what's, what's happened in this recent crisis and respond accordingly going forwards. Um, you can probably hear as well that I'm not Canadian, I'm British. And there's another thing I wanted to bring up here um, not relevant to, to data and, and society, but a, a separate component that I think um, is interesting as we emerge out of this crisis. Um, this is a crisis that has been felt all over the world, but there are many crises that other, ex other cities have experienced in past and for, sh for sure others will in future that we haven't had yet here in, in Toronto or Ottawa or, or other parts of Ontario. So when I, when I first um, came to Canada about two and a half years ago, I remember raising at um, a networking event that I had just lived through the through uh, terror attacks in London, where we had vans driving onto street onto sidewalks, active shooters jumping out, um, and shocking and terrible amounts of death happened in a very small amount of time. And I, I mentioned that at an event, and people laughed me off and said that doesn't happen here in Canada. Like that's not something that we have. Um, and unfortunately, two months later, actually I think it was two years ago today, um, we had a the exact exact incident happened, a van um, hitting pedestrians and a very sad loss of lives for, for the city. So I think there's an opportunity to learn from things that other cities are seeing and to be resilient to those shocks um, that, that cause a breakdown in, in our society that we can potentially um, prevent through very small but impactful infrastructure investments. Um, so there is, there is another thing I want to talk about, and that's more to do with the approach that we take to being resilient in our infrastructure. We, we often make investments uh, in infrastructure and measure their success through efficiency. Um, if we are delivering infrastructure that's efficient, we think it's successful. But actually, we, start, we probably need to see and are seeing a shift towards effectiveness of our infrastructure. Um, and for our infrastructure to be effective, I would argue that it needs to be flexible. Um, and sometimes that is the opposite of efficiency because it means we need to we need to invest more up front. Uh, we need to be considering um, change in use and considering the maintenance and operation of, of an asset um, to be flexible to future needs. One of the one of the character traits that um, is common to to communities that have survived any a catastrophe or crisis is that they have balanced infrastructure that is proportionate to the needs of the community. So. As our communities change, um, we need to have infrastructure that is flexible to to keep up with that and keep keep balance to that future need. Uh, one of the one of the approaches that we use here at WSP and I know is is used across the industry is scenario planning. So what we do through scenario planning, um, it's complementary and additional to the existing strategic planning process. And scenario planning looks at um, challenges the assumption that, that we know what the future will look like. Um, we might be able to project a future that we think will be here, but if we were to look at a number of alternative scenarios that could happen, we could have any one of a range of different futures. So through scenario planning, we stress test our existing approach um, against those alternative futures. And um, in that way, we're able to see which infrastructure investments and what type of infrastructure uh, will be resilient in the face of, of shocks that we're seeing to the system or stresses. Um, and another thing that I think is um, maybe maybe a bit little bit difficult for us to do, but right now we're living in 
an experiment really uh, and it's it's not a fun one to be in but I think we should we can and should be seeing opportunities to be flexible with the way that we recover and using our infrastructure in different ways. Um, I was speaking to one of my colleagues yesterday and he was saying, why don't this road space that we suddenly have um, almost fully available, we can be using that to, to speed up the, um, the construction process as once it's safe to do so and as we start going back to work but for sure if john was saying a third of our a third of our workforce will be unemployed so there'll be probably be less people using the roads um, and certainly everyone that's going back to work will not be physically going back to the office um, so maybe we can use that road space for a different for a different purpose maybe we can start doing autonomous vehicle testing uh, for example on on the road space that we have available um, there is one final point I want to talk to before we move on to the, the final um, how and when of infrastructure investment, and that is how we can support and enable our vulnerable populations to contribute more strongly to the economy. Uh, this has got nothing to do with how we emerge out of COVID-19. This is just something that I think is something that should be more considered in the way we deliver and design our infrastructure. Um, and we'll, if we were to look at the future trends for this, um, we're going to have an aging population here in Ontario. Uh, we're seeing a rise in people that are less able-bodied and a rise in mental health issues. Uh, we're seeing a rise in um, newcomers, about 14 to 15% rise in, in immigration to Ontario. Um, all of these people are very capable of contributing to our economy, but are often living in communities and, and uh, areas that aren't well connected with transit, that do not have the, the social and digital infrastructure to allow them to, to contribute. So I think we, we should be considering with the, with the infrastructure investments we were going to be making anyway, considering how we can, we can make some small changes to those to enable those um, vulnerable populations to contribute uh, more strongly to our economy um, and considering their health and well-being as a component of that as well. Um, so thanks, Claire. I, think, I just want to yeah, stop you there if I can for a minute because uh, I, I, you made a lot of really great points there that I want to make sure that uh, Sandro and Andy have have an opportunity to be able to address. And I, I think I want to go first to that digital component because you're right. I mean, if we're going to be this strong, digitally connected society that we are now as a result of this, but but Claire's right. I mean, you can't do a call like this or a Zoom call or any other kind of call without there being some sort of a, a digital hiccup along the way. And I'm just kind of curious that, you know, as we look to the investment, the innovative investment that we can make coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic is digital infrastructure something that we need to give a serious consideration to both as new assets, but also as we look at maybe ways that we can upgrade some of our existing assets to make them relevant 20, 30, 40 years down the road from now. Sandro, I, I see you nodding ahead. Your yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was uh, nodding furiously throw uh, Claire's entire uh, uh, presentation there. Uh, yeah, we've, uh, I, at OSPI, have been involved in a lot of these conversations. Uh, we're part of a group called the Engineering Change Lab that is looking at, you know, what, how do we want to engineer the future? What are future communities? Uh, you know, we're looking, there's a future city, a smart cities uh, uh, component to that as well. Uh, we're looking at, you know, what sort of training do we need to provide? How do we get um, un untraditional groups involved in engineering as well? Uh, for example, Indigenous youth. All of this really collates around this, um, this concept of building smart infrastructure, building smart communities. Uh, you know, it's not just sustainable. Obviously, they need to be sustainable climate change. Uh, you know, we need to develop um, uh, infrastructure that, is, that doesn't just adapt to the realities of climate change, but also help mitigate the results of climate change. Uh, but uh, infrastructure that takes into account uh, Industry 4.0, that interconnectivity of the vehicles, you know, so autonomous vehicles, but also electric vehicles. Do so we have enough charging stations? Do we have a resilient grid to support all these charging stations? Uh, broadband, high-speed internet, uh, not only for, you know, uh, urban areas, but rural areas. Uh, if we do want to get uh, other groups involved in this, uh, how do we have high-speed broadband internet in remote northern communities, in remote indigenous communities, so that uh, you know you can train 
young indigenous youth into in new STEM careers so that they can actually start to build smart communities in their own communities instead of, uh, you know, being uh, forgotten about. Uh, so, the, yeah, I, 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 th I think it's tremendous. I know uh, the engineering schools are starting to look at this as well. They are looking at the UN social development goals and have started the Canadian Engineering Grand Challenges that we're part of as well. Uh, we hosted an event in February called How to Change the World, and it was just that. It was how do we design the infrastructure we need for the cities of tomorrow? Uh, and, it, and we looked at various components. One was a, a climate change component, one was around sustainable energy, one was around clean uh, water. Uh, and so I yeah, totally agree with what Claire was saying. And it's something that isn't part of the conversation yet and needs to be. So, uh, you know, I, maybe the technology isn't ready yet, but as we're developing the infrastructure, how do we design the infrastructure so that it can be easily upgraded? Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, parts can be upgraded uh, from a technology perspective easily, you know, go in, upgrade this component without having to tear down the infrastructure and build a new one. That's a great point, Sandra. And that's often something when I speak to my engineers and I say, hey, look, we should be preparing for a future where technology is, is a bigger component of what we do. They say, well, we don't we don't know what that will look like. And they're right. Ten years ago, none of us would have believed that we'd all be sat here on, you know, video and audio having a conversation um so when we try to look 10 years ahead it's it's especially difficult so sometimes i think you're it's about you're right it's about flexibility and designing in the capacity for change and um sometimes you know it's just maybe putting an extra uh, an accessible panel in the walls of your building so that you can upgrade that digital infrastructure yeah yeah, we're living in the day of the Jetsons, right? We're doing the video <laughs> yeah. conferencing, the video, and uh, pretty, and they're working on uh, cars that can fly. So you know, yeah, we're living right. in days no, of the Jetsons. No, I didn't even get into drones, but I won't, I won't dive into that yet. <laughs> I, I'm gonna, I want to bring Andy into the conversation. I'm curious. I know Andy and his group at RCCAO have done a a great deal of work, kind of investigating and investing in. Um, you know, information regarding, you know, some of the future infrastructure, you know, the amount of work that Andy and his group have done researching AVs and the, and the trends in the decades ahead. And Andy, I'm just curious to get your input on on everything that's been said by, by Claire and Sandra, because I know it uh, resonates with some of the work you're already doing. First of all, uh, Claire, um, we've never met before, but uh, very refreshing to hear your comments. I think uh, we do need to take that big picture approach and learn from what we're going through right now to come out of this perhaps with a different uh, way of living and, and interacting and certainly mobility will be a big part of that. Before I get into AVs, I just wanted to uh, remind people though, um, in Boston, they had the big dig, uh, which went way over budget. Originally that was uh, intended to be a transportation project to get more cars away from uh, the, uh, the surface level of Boston. But as they went through the project, they realized, well, we should be putting in fiber optic cables or we should do this or that. So the cost did balloon way out of proportion. But in the end, there were many benefits from doing something. And I think that's what other jurisdictions uh, learn from, uh, from the Boston experience. So, I mean, uh, new mobility is something that uh, we've been talking about for a long time. Uh, you know, whether this particular pandemic uh, pushes us faster in terms of certain directions with respect to AVs remains to be seen because right now uh, transit ridership uh, has been hit really hard. I think, uh, you know, Go Transit trains and buses are down 90%. TTC is probably down about 85%. Um, uh, in my local neighborhood, you know, uh, the game we play is uh, looking at the buses go by and at the most I've seen, you know, two or three people typically sitting at the back of the bus because that's where they enter and the one driver at the front. So you might have four people and a pretty big piece of metal that's, you know, burning fuel uh, or, you know, if, if they're not EV type. Um, so, you know, will this present an opportunity for, um, you know, doing more autonomous type travel? Maybe for safety reasons in the interim, we're going to have little pods that contain, you know, no more than three or four people to take us where we want to go. So it'll be less a sharing mobility than one that is a protection from a virus kind of transportation. I'm hoping that we get all through that and there's a vaccine or you know people become immune uh, to whatever it is that's out there and we get back to normal because in large cities, let's face it, uh, we need mass transit to get around. It's, it's a workhorse. 
Uh, and we have to, I think, as I said with the report we just released yesterday, we have to continue making those investments if we want our uh, urban regions to thrive. And I recognize all the stuff that Claire said that, uh, you know, we have to think uh, in a more green and sustainable fashion. So let's try to do all these different things together. And it should be a multiple objective uh, uh, lens that we're putting on things nowadays. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Thanks, Andy. Uh, I just want to go back to there for a second and just talk about the fact that, you know, I mean, it's it's great that we have this this wonderful holistic view of how uh, infrastructure, it's not just about taking the physical asset approach, but it's also taking the social approach. What what concerns me is how do we is there a way for us to drill that down? for provincial and federal government officials that's going to allow them to really understand what that looks like from an from an infrastructure investment point of view in time for us to look at the fact that you know they're going to make quote unquote shovel ready investments in the weeks and months to come um hang on one second <laughs> you're with us uh, uh, can you hear me yeah oh yeah Oh, okay, great. I was um, struggling to like see where my mouse had gone there. Um, I think I think we need to recognize that each of our each of our municipalities and our provinces and even down to our suburbs, they all look different. Like the future looks different for each of them. Uh, we're probably not going to have a crisis quite like this ever again. Um, I hope that we don't. So we should be we should be looking at the trends that we're seeing within each of those regions um, and looking 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 at the the data that that's already there and, and projecting that going forwards um having said that i think that there are there are some things that will be common across each of our regions um one thing that i've observed like working in a company of eight and a half thousand people you have to dig you have to dig deep to get the skills and the expertise but it's there and i think that applies within our towns and, and municipalities and and provinces as well um so i I think finding the data and finding the trends that we're already seeing emerging and allowing that to inform the decision making on our on our infrastructure projects um, is really important. I think another component uh, that that kind of goes complementary to that is the looking at what gaps we have. So we might have the data and we might have the people, but there's probably some gaps that we're not yet addressing. Um, there'll be some skills gaps and there'll be some data gaps. So how can we how can we fill those gaps both now and going forwards uh, so that we're making the decisions that will not just serve today and the next five years, but will serve our communities uh, for, for decades and for generations to come? Thanks, Claire. Sandra, I'm just wondering, you know, if we're looking at the possibility of investing, um, you know, across a real plethora of places, because we're not just talking about physical infrastructure, but we're also talking about, you know, landscape architecture, and we're talking about uh, digital assets, so perhaps more, more broadband, 5G, what have you. If we really spread that investment out across that much of the quote unquote infrastructure space, isn't that going to allow us to more than likely use the skilled labor workforce more efficiently as we have it right now because we're not trying to centralize a single skill set we're we're pushing it across all the different types of infrastructure we could possibly build that, that's it exactly you want this infrastructure money this in um, this investment to actually have multiplying effects you want to try to impact as many different facets of your society as possible. So yeah, it's it, you know if we're building uh, the infrastructure for the future, for future generations, we have a bigger ROI. And the more professionals that get involved in that, uh, again, the more you, you take their perspectives because they are also part people who live in that society. So you know you can't have a small group of people designing what the future is. You need a broad group of people designing the future and all being involved in, in developing their part of it. Uh, I was going to uh, build on one aspect uh, of Claire's answer as well, and I, I know we're getting close to the end, so this might be my, my parting words as well. Uh, when we talk about investment, we also need to, you know, when we talk about investment in infrastructure, and given John's comments about a number of people who have lost their job and, and you know, their, their employment prospects are, are dim, uh, we need to also talk about investing in our people, investing in, uh, you know, Canadians and people in Ontario. And how do we reskill them in, so that they can contribute to designing the Canada and Ontario that we want? Uh, so what are the future skills they need to have, uh, you know, in the digital world? 
uh, you know, we have, uh, I know the productivity is low in, in a lot of our industries right now, uh, you know, specifically in, in engineering uh, that I can speak to. Uh, now's the time actually to, to retrain uh, your engineers so that they can fill in some of the skill gaps that have been identified by uh, employers. Uh, we run job fairs uh, for engineering and technology companies right across the province. And, you know, we'll have 200, app 200 applicants come through the door uh, and, you know, 15, 20 companies. And in the end, you know, we go up to the employer and say, well, you know, did you find anyone? And they said, no, not really. And I go, what do you mean not really? Because you've had 200 people come across your desk. And it's like, yeah, but they don't have the skills we're looking for. Well, again, if, you know, the universities can only do so much in training people on the skills for today. What employers are looking for is we need people to design for tomorrow. You know, they're not out there. You know, the, you may be lucky to have a big company like WSP with, what is it, 8,500 employees where you can actually dig deep and try to find those people. But if you're a small, medium-sized enterprise, you don't have them and you're not going to find them. Uh, so it starts at time. Now is the time to actually start investing in them and start developing them so that you can actually put your company in the forefront so that when we do scale up, your company is going to benefit from that. Thanks, Andrew. Andy, is this a similar thing that you're seeing with your membership where um, perhaps, you know, they don't have the the transferable skill set to be able to meet whatever the demand is at the time? Or do you have, you know, the right people in place to be able to meet the demands of, of the sector you're, you're in? Well, like many other sectors, uh, construction uh, previous to the pandemic, uh, has been facing uh, severe uh, shortages, certainly in some of the trades. Um, I would say that, you know, not that, because, because I want the, you know, everyone to rise together. This has to be a collaborative societal effort. Um, but <laughs> I'm putting on uh, my, my hat as the chair of the Ontario uh, Construction Careers Alliance. And I would encourage uh, young people to consider an opportunity in the um, skilled trades and construction because um, there are lots of opportunities. Now, certainly, um, you know, some skills are transferable, but um, uh, I represent the unionized construction sector and there, there is very good labor management training, uh, both facilities and on site. And I think that as we adapt to the new reality, of course, uh, I would like to see our workforce uh, adapt and be flexible to the new realities. And I think uh, we can rise to that challenge. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ann. Folks, we've uh, unfortunately run out of time. We're, we're near the top of the hour, and I want to make sure everyone gets back to their incredible busy days, including our three fantastic speakers that are with us. So uh, just one final thank you to Claire and Andy and Sandro for joining us this morning. Thank you very much. And folks, uh, if you look at the chat, I've just entered my email address in the chat under actual media. Uh, it's andrew at actualmedia.ca. If you have a question for any of our speakers that have joined us today and you would like to be able to still ask that to that person, I certainly invite you to get in touch with me and I can definitely connect you with Claire, Sandro, Andy, or John at, at any given time. Before I go, just a couple final notes. Uh, first of all, remember that yes, you will get emailed a link to this presentation in the coming days. You'll be able to review it and uh, take any notes you need to. Hopefully you weren't spending your entire time scribbling everything down. So, uh, you know, you'll be able to reference this presentation at any time. And lastly, uh, there are some deliverables that are coming out of this presentation as well. So we'll be producing about a 2,000 to 2,500 word feature article that will appear as the cover story in the July, August issue of Renew Canada. We'll also be passing that along to representatives at the provincial and federal government level so they can learn from the conversation that we've had today as well. And uh, we should be posting a new story uh, in the next few days just to kind of give a recap of our conversation. So thank you very much to, to John, to Claire, to Sandro and to Andy for joining us today. And thank you very much to the Construction Design Alliance of Ontario for helping sponsor today's conversation. I'm Andrew Macklin, Managing Editor of Renew Canada. Thank you so much for joining us here today and watch out for more information as we host future discussions in the months to come. Thanks so much. Have a great day, everyone.